Welcome to the Thriving on Purpose podcast, where we teach Christian entrepreneurs how to build a strong foundation of faith, growth, and skill to lead and thrive on purpose in life and business. And now, here are your hosts, certified coaches, Elizabeth and Sebastian Richard. Hi there. Thanks for joining us on the Thriving on Purpose podcast. I'm Elizabeth Richard, and I'm here with my husband, Sebastian Richard. Hi, guys. And today is an exciting episode. We're at episode 30, and it's going to be about becoming unstoppable, how to grow from undertaker to game changer. So it's going to be an exciting, impactful uh, lesson, and you're going to love it if you're into leadership and you're an entrepreneur, this is a great podcast for you. You're going to want to share it with your other friends who are entrepreneurs as well. And if you haven't signed up to our podcast, I don't know where you're listening in from, but if you're on iTunes, you can subscribe. If you've been following us for a while, you can leave us a review on iTunes to let us know how you're enjoying this podcast. And um, on the thrivingonpurposepodcast.com website, you can also sign up to get each episode into your inbox every week. So today's episode will be a little different in the format that we usually use, okay? So today's episode will be based on a teaching we were fortunate to get by uh, CEO leadership expert, Dave Anderson. And this teaching comes from his book titled, Unstoppable, Transforming Your Mindset to Create Change to Accelerate Results and Be the Best at What You Do. I got to tell you guys, this teaching was amazing. And Dave is a tremendously gifted leadership teacher and speaker. I mean, I was blown away by his speaking ability. This guy, like, is a, he doesn't look for his words. He just, like, goes straight at it. And he's just so dynamic. well-versed and dynamic. And just, like, it just flows out of him. Like, it's imprinted in his DNA and his soul. So I really enjoyed listening to Dave. Uh, we took a ton of notes Uh, which is why we wanted to share this great content with you today. Absolutely. We believe this teaching will add tremendous value to you and help you build the mindset and attitudes of a game changer. Game changer. That's the word you're going to see again and again during this podcast because that's that's the goal in the end to become a game changer. God has positioned us to be game changers on the earth. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 10 says this about what was provided for us to be just that. Listen to this, guys, okay? That's Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 10. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And the Apostle Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 1, verse 3, His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Amen. What a great verse. So what does this all mean? It means we as believers are called to a life of excellence without excuses. He's provided us with all things so we wouldn't make excuses. So we are positioned to become game changers, but most of us aren't, and that needs to change. 
And for that to change, you need to change. And there are things that you can do to change that. And today's podcast is all about that. And that's why I really enjoy Dave's teaching. All right, guys, you got that? Good. We're glad you got that. So let's dig deeper to climb higher, shall we? There are four main levels people operate on in life and business. The way these levels are presented is in a team setting, okay? So that's the way that Dave, oper- uh, when he presented his talk, when he did his talk, he, he presented it as if it was a sports analogy, okay? So he, he was talking about comparing it to players and teamwork and a team in a team setting. Every player on any team falls into one of these four categories, and the four categories are undertakers, caretakers, playmakers, and game changers. You and everybody else has a category that describes your most frequent level of play, your most consistent level of performance. While we may all have moments or days where we operate in one of those four categories, there is one category that describes our most consistent level of play. That's the category that best describes us. And although you may find yourself in one category today, it doesn't mean it'll be the same for tomorrow. Okay, so either for the better or worse, either you'll improve or you might, even if you're at the top, you might go down if you don't work on yourself. So we'd like to go in a little more detail. So we're going to start and we're going to dig in with the number one. Liz? So we're going to talk about being an undertaker. So what does that mean? Undertakers on any given team are the underperformers. Okay, there are many reasons why one can be an underperformer. For some, it is simply the lack of skill, knowledge, experience, or know-how. With the right attitude, this can be corrected, so that's a good news, especially if coupled with good training, knowledge, and growing experience. Yeah, and Jim Rohn, the, uh, the great business philosopher, he once gave the best definition of the ultimate undertaker in a speech. It's quite humorous. And he said it in a humorous way, but we just got to share it with you guys. So I got the clip. So just listen to this clip by Jim Rohn. First, we're affected by what we know. When I talk to the kids in high school classes, college classes, that's the first thing I tell them. Get the information while you're here. Nothing worse than being stupid when you get out of school. So get the information. Being broke is bad, but being stupid is what's really bad. And what's really, really bad is being broke and stupid. (laughs) Nothing much worse than that, unless you're sick. Right? Sick, broke, and stupid. That's about as far as you can fall unless you're ugly. (laughs) Right? (laughs) But surely that would be the ultimate, right? The ultimate negative life. Ugly, sick, broke, and stupid. So learn all you can. We're life... We're affected by what we know, so get the information. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in going through the books, building your library, coming to classes like this consistently, consistently. Some of them will be so dramatic, your life will never be the same. Okay, we're back. So that was really funny, especially the way you said it, right? So I take it that there are not too many among you who are so ill-equipped as what Jim just described. I hope that nobody among you falls in that category of, of being all those four things. But there's another type of undertaker that's very different. He's a, it's a very different animal than what we just described, okay? Many are undertakers not because of a lack of skill, talent, or knowledge, but because they have the wrong mindset. In fact, some undertakers are the most talented individual on their respective team. Talent does not equal contribution. There's a lot of talented people out there who do not contribute the way they should because they have the wrong attitude. Okay, so let me repeat that. Talent does not equal contribution. Some individuals can be so talented that they become toxic in their attitudes. As a hockey fan, I've seen these guys come and go. So I've been uh, watching hockey since I was about 14 years old on television and following the players and listening to their interviews and all that. And you know what? I've realized that when they're drafted, you know, the expectations are high. When a a highly talented guy is drafted, the expectations are very high. So these guys have the talent to rise to the top. 
but they are often their own worst enemy. Sometimes these undertakers on a team that have a lot of talent, they show signs of being, for example, poor team players, or conceited, or abrasive, or they'll blame others for their results, or they have a woe is me attitude, or they're complainers, cocky, selfish, or they're just in it for the money. So you get the picture, I hope, after all this. I don't care how much talent you have. If you have these attitudes, you will be a detriment to any team. You will be, in spite of your talent, an undertaker. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen this happen many times also in um, in different organizations where it, where it comes to marketing and sales. Um, you know, sometimes with the status of being a great recruiter or a top performer, um, maybe you have really good, you know, personal skills, social skills, and you recruit a lot of people into the organization or make a lot of sales. You can get to this place where you become very cocky and just relying on that talent and uh, lacking in all the other things that we're going to talk about. So you can go from that game changer status to actually dropping to Undertaker just because of that. Mm, that's a good point. And there's another example from the NHL, uh, a real life example, uh, of a young hockey player back in 1993 who was drafted by the Ottawa Senators. His name was Alexandre Daigle. So Alexander, basically. His nickname, get this, the media nicknamed him Alexander the Great. I kid you not. He was compared to hockey stars like Steve Eiserman and Joe Sackick and Pat LaFontaine at the time, okay? So there was much hype and much expectation on this player's level, on this player's talent, okay? He had tremendous talent. And his arrival in the NHL was very highly anticipated, so much so that he was offered a contract at the time, I think it was something around the $12 million for I don't know how many years the, the Ottawa Senators were so excited to draft him. But today, Alexander Daigle's career in the NHL is known as one of the biggest flops in all of NHL history. Alexander Daigle was your prototypical undertaker. It wasn't for lack of talent. It was because of a poor attitude that resulted in a toxic mindset. He was toxic for himself and for all of those around him. And that's how you become not only replaceable, but very forgettable. Now that said, uh, although Alexander Degg was a big flop in the NHL, I, I got the opportunity to listen to a couple of interviews uh, throughout the years of him later because, you know, sometimes reporters get nosy or curious. They want to know where the guy is at. And, and there was some progress made. And I, I, today he's a, he's a guy that, you know, I don't have anything against him or anything. And he, he's, uh, he's done well for himself, actually. He works in the movie industry. He's like a movie producer in Montreal. And he's married and he's got three kids. So he kind of, um, all the years and, and I guess the wisdom kicked in eventually. And uh, he's built himself up into a respectable individual. But at the time, he did not have the mindset or the attitudes to go, to basically to stay where his talent took him. So that made him an undertaker. He had very, very, very high talent, high expectation, big contract, but he could not back it up because his mindset just was not on par with his talent. And that happened, we see that a lot with young, um, young players, you know, he was very young when all this happened to him. And sometimes that, you know, they rely on their talent and they rely on the scores and they don't realize that there's so much more to being a powerful player, right? Yeah, well, it's not and every 20 year old to stay also in the who, game who, who for... can have the maturity exactly. to come into the limelight with so much money. And to just uh, deal with it in, the, in a good fame. way. Yeah, yeah, because it's not every individual. So it's, uh, that that played against him for sure. He was quite young, but uh, there are some who pull it off. Like he looked like Sidney Crosby came in very young, and there are others. There's a countless others who did very well for themselves. Joe Sack is another one. Steve Eiserman. They were all young when they got drafted, but they had the maturity. They had the mindset. They they had the work ethic. So uh, that helped them throughout their career. 
Exactly. So that brings us to number two. So we're going to talk about the caretakers. Mm -hmm. The caretakers are those players on any team who do what is required of them. Nothing less, nothing more. They take care of business. They get the job done. So you're probably thinking in your organization, in your business, there are a lot of consistent, reliable people out there that you know do what they're supposed to do they don't give more they don't give less everything's pretty much even they are consistently average and uh, do baseline work so i don't intend to make this sound super negative but when you're talking about leadership we're we're or going performance yeah we're talking about leadership and performance you don't want to stay on that level okay so most people in most organizations fall in that category so the caretakers are usually followers. They could become leaders if they so desired. Why? Simply because they are capable of more. Exactly. Very well put. They are capable of more, but they settle for average. So that's your basic caretaker. And some caretakers believe themselves to be more than they really are. They feel they deserve a bigger pay or more recognition for just getting the job done. They feel they deserve pats on the back and plaques on their wall for doing just baseline work. Not wanting more and not doing more. This mindset is the greatest enemy of the caretaker and what keeps him or her where he's at. That's the thing. They don't want more and they, want to do, they don't want to do more. Uh, Dave Anderson, in his teaching, he put it this way. Caretakers are people who believe that others get all the breaks success, and money for the work that they will never do. They do the minimum baseline work and think it's heroic. Winners, on the other hand, they outwork them, they outthink them, they outfight them, they outlast them, and they outclass them. Caretakers cannot expect game-changer recognition for baseline caretaker performance. The caretakers do their jobs. As a result, they will always have a job and the game changers will always be their boss. So if you're mostly a caretaker, you don't want to stay there. Yeah, that was absolutely powerful when he uh, went through those numbers, when he was saying, it's really true, the game changer will outwork them, outthink them, outfight them, outlast them, and outclass them. Yeah. So when you think of what that implicates, you know, it's really going the extra mile. You're exactly. changing levels. Exactly. And so when you change level, then you get the rewards that go with that. So, you know, we live in a, in a world where it's not enough to just do baseline and to do what you're told. Unless if you, you want to keep, stand out. Some, some people just want to keep their job, right? Yeah. If you want to keep your job, do that. Be a caretaker. Exactly. But when it comes to leadership and you want to make your mark, this is what we're talking about there's different types of players so now we're going to get to the third performance level we're going to talk about the playmakers organizations who have good playmakers have good results most of the time so tell us about the playmakers sebastian yeah well playmakers are those players who have the talent a good attitude and who bring in extraordinary results once in a while you see uh, playmakers they really stand out. They'll win games for your organizations. They'll do the good plays. They, they, they're, 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 they're good. They're really good. So you'll definitely spot them on your team. They're hungrier than most of your other players. The problem with playmakers is that they break their own momentum. They lack the consistency when they hit their winning stride, and that's what keeps them from becoming game changers. They don't know how to level up by maintaining their momentum. So the main problem of playmakers is not in their mechanics, their talent, their skill, or their knowledge base. This is all good. The problem for most playmakers is in their mindset. Larry Robinson, who was a, an NHL uh, All of Fame defenseman, and later an NHL coach, quite a good one at, at that, he once said, he, there was a great quote from him, it says this, success in hockey, is 80% a mental game and the other 20% is just in your mind. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now that that's a great quote about mindset and I really smiled when I when I read that. I thought it was great. 
So oftentimes, if you're coaching a playmaker, he's only one or two mindset tweaks away from becoming a game changer. Some playmakers are only one attitude or discipline away from becoming incredible game changers, impactors, and legacy leaders. Mm. Yeah, and before we address the, so you got you got the the, the goods on the playmaker. Okay, so you, you might have, uh, as we spoke, you know, if you have an organization or a team working with you and stuff, you might have had the mental image of, oh yeah, that's that's he's describing so and so, or it could be you. Could be you. But before we address the final performance level of game changers, we just want to point out two very important lessons from this teaching so far. There are two very important things to keep in mind. Number one, all of us, we are all a blend of the four types of performers, okay? Some days we are playmakers or even game changers. Other days we are caretakers or even undertakers. But here's what you'll notice. The type that you find yourself most dominates your days is the one you need to identify with and work up from. Okay, so you're going to see, you're going to notice there's going to be one type that that we've described so far. You're going to be like, you know what? On most days, that's me. Well, if that's the case, look at that. And and, and I hope you're, I hope you guys are didn't find yourself in any of those types yet. Maybe you're all game changers. I don't know. But if you found yourself in one of the three types we've described so far, you need to tell yourself, okay, so I'm so-and-so and and I need to work from there. So this is my, this is where I'm at. And this is what I'm going to need to work on and be aware of because you need to be aware of things to change them, right? Yeah, this is not a life sentence. Okay. (laughs) So it's possible to change and work on that. And that's the second point. That's the second thing we want you to keep in mind. The performance level type you find yourself is, is not permanent. So like Liz said, it's not a life sentence. An undertaker can have a catalyst that prompts them into working on themselves and soon find themselves to be playmakers. And in the same manner, a game changer who's been at the top for a couple of years can become cocky or lazy and fall all the way down to become an undertaker. It's happened. I've seen it happen. Okay. So now let's talk about the level we should all aspire to perform at. The game changer. Game changers offer high level performance day in and day out. They are consistently great at what they do. But it's not by accident, luck, more talent, or because they're special. They bring real and positive change to people they come in contact with and also to organizations they work for. They leave an imprint. They leave a legacy. They have impact. But how do they get there? Game changers have built daily habits and thinking patterns that enable them to perform at this level. They have focused harder on their mindset than anything else and their results speak for themselves. So here are the eight traits that are common to all game changers out there. These eight traits separate game changers from the others in any setting, corporate, entrepreneurial, church, community. Game changers put in, number one, more effort, number two, more energy, number three, more enthusiasm, number four, more excellence, Number five, more passion. Number six, more attitude. Number seven, more focus. And number eight, more integrity. Okay, so if you didn't jot those down, rewind and jot them down. They're very important. So now you might ask, why do game changers put in more effort, energy, enthusiasm, excellence, passion, attitude, focus, and energy than most people? Well, that's a very good question. That's a very good question to ask. Where, in fact, does one find the motivation for all this? That's a really good question. These eight traits that separate game changers from the rest is the result of those people knowing the answer to two very important questions. They have found the answers to the following questions and these two questions go together okay so maybe you'll want to jot that down 
Anyway, we're going to put them in the show notes. <laughs> okay. And the two questions are this. Why should I get up in the morning? And why should anyone care? Let me repeat that. Why should I get up in the morning? And why should anyone care? It's the same for you. It's the same for me. Our why has to be strong enough. People aren't part of the race because their why isn't strong enough. People who perform at the undertaker and caretaker level just haven't found a strong enough why. And speaking of why, we have the teacher of this really good uh, stuff we're, get, we're dishing out today, Dave Anderson himself, talking about the importance of your why in a short clip that we're going to share with you. So here's Dave Anderson talking about the importance of your why. Listen, it, listen now to this great clip. Resilience, sticking with it. Now, I'll tell you what helps resilience is, is purpose. When you've got a great goal, you won't quit on it. I have found people that give up don't have big enough goals. It's harder to quit if you've got bigger goals. I call it your why. You've heard it. Your why, your W-H-Y. I've been speaking about the why for years. The why, the why, that's your reason. It's your reasons. And without that why, it's easy to quit. You know what I mean by the why? Here's why I'm working so hard. Here's why I'm starting so early. Here's why I'm going so late. Here's why I no longer hang around with those people. Here's why I watch less television and read more books. Here's why I've quit that habit and I've started this habit. Here's why I want to move into that house. I want to drive that car. I want to help my sick mother who can't help herself. I want to send my kids to that school. I want to help that group of orphans, maybe, because I was one at one point in my life, or whatever your story is. And you lose your way when you lose your why. And the challenge is, the more successful you get, if you're not careful, your why starts to get smaller because you're scratching a lot of that stuff off the list. And so you find it easier to quit because you don't have as much worth fighting for. Some of you right now, you're living in the house that was once your why. Scratch it off the list. At one time you said, boy, I wish I could live in a house like that. Well, you're in it. For some of you right now, you're driving the car that was once your why. At one time you said, boy, if I could have a car like that. Well, you've got it. You're making the money that was once your why at one point you said boy if i can make that much a year well you've surpassed it your kids have graduated from the school that was once your why and if you don't continue to redefine that why you'll find it easy to quit you won't have anything worth fighting for you've got to stay hungry but nobody can make you hungry the why makes you hungry and it comes from the inside out i'll tell you what exhausts me people you got to wind up every day because they got no why Every day they need a hug, you gotta hug them and burp them and nurse them and coddle them. Aren't they exhausting? Every day. It's like, oh my goodness. It's like, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or ornerier, but I know I'm no longer interested in smacking people in the head with a bat and dragging them around the bases. <laughs> I gotta have people on my team, they're ready, they're willing, they're able, they have a why that moves them. What do you get, what does your why move you? You know, if you look up the word hunger in the dictionary, you know what it says? An intense desire, a compelling craving. That's a powerful definition. Hunger, an intense desire. A compelling craving, not just a desire, not just a craving. It's intense and it's compelling. If something's intense and compelling, should it move you? So what moves you? What moves you? What is your why? Maybe it's time to redefine it. I guarantee you, you'll become more resilient. You'll have something worth fighting for. Okay, so we're back. So you see, your why moves you. Your why makes you get up with zest in the morning. And you know, without a doubt, why you're getting up matters to other people. That is the game changer's MO. That's what keeps him hungry, okay? That's what keeps the game changer hungry. It's his why. Les Brown said, you gotta be hungry. Well, you won't be hungry 
unless you find a strong enough why. And you're in luck. You really are. Because we have another clip by Dave Anderson where he, he gives a great illustration of just how you do that. How do you stay hungry? Here's a short clip by Dave Anderson in which he explains a great illustration, a great tip, a visual for you on how to stay hungry. I found a, a seven-time world champion that's in three Karate Hall of Fames that I respect immensely. I've started to take him lessons from. But what he did the first day, and I think this will, anybody can relate to this. I don't unless you're dead. I'd, I'd be the only guy that can't really relate to what I'm getting ready to tell you. But, but what he said was he pointed to the wall, and there were twelve belts on the wall, from white all the way to black, and those are the twelve belts you'd go through to become a black belt in the Tung Soo Do style of karate, which is what I take. And he pointed to the red belt, which was the belt right before black. Now, in a lot of styles, it's brown, but in my style, it's red. He said, you see that red belt? I said, yes, sir. He said, let me tell you something. He said, the red belts are the, are the most dangerous fighters in the studio or anywhere else you're likely to go spar. Well, I'm new, right? I don't know anything. So I'm looking at the black belt. I say, well, what about, you know, what about the black belt? I mean, isn't that the objective to at least become a first degree black? And he said, don't get me wrong. He said, we got some great black belt fighters, but let me tell you what happened. He said, people will work for years and years to pass their black belt test. Some of them have to take it six, seven times before they pass it. And when they pass it, they have this mental exhale. And it's like, now I've arrived. And even though there's 10 degrees, right? I mean, most people won't live long. I'm a second degree. Most people won't live long enough or stay fit enough to get to all 10 degrees. He said, the number one thing a black belt does after they pass the test is they start putting on weight because they're not coming in as often. And when they're coming in, they're not training as hard. They're walking around giving advice like they're Jackie Chan, right? And so he said, but the red belt, is hungry. He's got a why. He's got something worth fighting for. They're hungry. They're humble. They got a chip on their shoulder. Anyone that's listening, if you've ever been that belt next to the top, I mean, you know how bad you want it. You want it so bad, and nothing's going to stop you. He said, I have seen more hungry red belts knock down or knock out complacent black belts. He said, so here's the lesson. He said, if you ever get your black belt, continue to think like a red. He said, act like a challenger, even if you're a champ. Challengers are hungry, they're humble, they got something to prove. Champs get cocky, complacent, turn to know-it-alls, and lose their edge. So as he's telling me this, I'm thinking, well, this, this applies. Yeah, I get it in the martial arts, but this is anything. I mean, this is business. This is being the top salesman of the month and thinking you've arrived and getting a black belt mindset, and you're not working as hard. You're cutting corners, right, and you lose something. And so I start researching hunger, right? And, and where does it come from? I mean, I'm in my 40s when I'm working on this. I've always been hungry, but really, where does it come from? And, and how do you keep it going? And how, when you get really successful, do you not let up? I mean, these are challenges. They're very real. And it, it all goes back to the why. So there you have it. This is how you can become unstoppable. And I want to add to this, there's one thing that he also said that I thought was really good. You know, sometimes when you're um, working towards a certain goal and you think that you're going to reach that goal and then you're going to always have this hunger, right? And you're working, working towards that goal. But he was also explaining the other side of the coin is that a lot of people do get to that goal and then they sort of lose their why. It's, it's not strong enough. And he was talking about the importance of, you know, building that legacy and wanting to make a bigger impact. So making your why bigger. So, and he was talking about his life and he was saying that every year he looks at, you know, his why and regularly and monthly. And it's a regular part of his of his monthly and weekly and daily habits. So that's that for me was uh that for me was really important to to it really hit me hard because I really thought of that. You know, sometimes like we we think of our business and we think of what is our why and you know where we're going in our business and and our purpose and all that, but we don't think of of it on a daily basis. We don't think of it on a monthly basis, you mm -hmm. know. So that changes things because your why will change and it'll get stronger. And as as you walk with God and grow in your relationship with God, He's going to show you more of what He He wants for you and your purpose, um, in the purpose that He has designed for you, right? Yeah, and also I think it's it's a really good point you bring up. And if you find your why is getting weaker 
maybe you just haven't found the right why. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's an expression that says uh, there's a lot of people who climb up the ladder only later in life to find out that it was on the wrong wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to be one of those people who go up, up, up in life, and then you realize when you're at the top, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's what's so important. As Christian entrepreneurs, we have a bigger why. We have a, a bigger purpose than, dare I say it, the people who don't walk with God. A lot of people out there don't walk with God and they think they have a big why, but I'm sorry. If you're not walking with God, your why, it, 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 it's, it's going to reach a ceiling. It's going to reach a ceiling. It's going to be done uh, humanly. It's going to be done in your own strength. It's going to be done uh, with a different perspective, not just an eternal perspective, but just an earthly, limited perspective. But when you have God, you have eternity in mind. You have your purpose in mind. You have your reason for being in mind. You have a maker in mind who made you for a purpose. You have all that going uh, as you you work your way through, as you work your way up. Um, All that just feeds your soul in such a way that uh, when you do climb up, you know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it. Exactly. And you have to get to that place in your in your mind. You know, he was talking about mindset and how important it is to get into this kingdom mindset where you're an ambassador for God and you're fulfilling your purpose and you're doing what uh, what he's asking you to do. And that makes your why even more strong, right? Because you know who your leader is. You know who you're following And he ignites you. He gives you that passion as well. So it's very different from a why that's more materialistic based. It doesn't have the same, you know, power and it'll, it'll get you, like he said, to a certain point and it's not enough. It just isn't enough to, to propel you day in and day out. And that's, you know, we did a study on uh, the uh, different uh, successful Christian entrepreneurs that you can go listen to. I can put in the resource section for you. And it's what the successful Christian entrepreneurs have in common. And it's mainly focused around that. They, they're they driven by something completely different. And their why is strong because of it, because God's implicated in their why. And I think the best summation of this, the best uh, summing up summation of this comes from Jesus Christ when he said, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And it's true. I mean, and that there are so many entrepreneurs out there who are revered. They are put on a pedestal and people just flock to listen to them speak and they buy their books. And and I'm sorry. They're just, to me, they they seem like people who are trying to gain the whole world. And I, I, I don't. Those aren't the types of people I admire. The types of entrepreneurs I admire. I'm just going to give that as a parenthesis here are those who have attained a high level of success. Those who add value to others in the process and those whose lives leave a lasting impact and legacy for God. And those who also in the process of doing all of that have a wife or a husband who loves them dearly and have children who feel they are blessed because that person is their parent, or their their, wife, their mother, or their father. Those are the ones I, I, I really look at. I'm like, yeah, that's the model I want for me. So people who have, um, who 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 are so balanced, and who have such a high level in everything, like their marriage, good marriage, it is flowing. It's it's good. It's working. They love each other. Their kids respect them, honor them, love them. Uh, the the people who work with them, they want to be like them. They uh, they they would they would give all their their last uh, sweat for them, last blood for them. They respect them. Uh, so everywhere they go, these people have an ability to be liked, known, and trusted. These are the people that, in my mind, have the whole thing going. Exactly. There has to be balance. And I heard uh, Dave Anderson talk about this in a, in a video. And I've heard many uh, great Christian entrepreneurs talk about this. It's so important to get your life in order at home, to have a good relationship with your spouse, uh, to make time for your kids when all of that 
um, is, you know, balanced. And I know sometimes it's not perfect, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you know, your time is divided and all. But if you make a priority of giving your family what they need, then everything else is going to be working s smoother and you'll have your focus and, you know, you're not divided because things aren't going, things are haywire at home. So that's a really, really important uh, point and a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, especially young entrepreneurs, don't see the importance of that when they're starting out. They're so driven, they're so focused on what they want, on their goals, that they neglect what's important and not realizing until later when it's too late that they've lost what was really, really important. Yeah, and you know, the Bible talks a lot about idolatry. Your work, your passion, your business can become an idol. If you're not careful, if your 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 why is not orderly, if it's not there's no priorities in it, if you're not careful, you will find yourself in a position where you are committing the sin of idolatry. And I know people think oh, I'm not worshiping a statue. No, you're not. But you're worshiping your job or you're worshiping money because you just want more, more, more all the time, and you want a bigger car, bigger house, bigger this, bigger that. And you eventually uh, fall for the trap of worshiping money. I'm not saying that having a good house, a great car, bigger house is wrong. I'm just saying you got to watch your priorities as you do so, as you as you go up in life and your business. You have to watch these things. You should you should always have in the back of your head. You should want more to bless more. Exactly. So want more of whether it's money or you know going higher in an organization to have uh, you know to be able to make more of an impact. Always think how you can bless people more. And, you know, I've I've studied a lot of uh, John Maxwell's, um, the different things that he's done in his life, and that keeps on coming back every time he talks about, uh, you know, purpose and legacy and all that and significance. It's always about doing more for others, adding value for others, and that's what drives him. You can see by his verbiage and everything, that's what drives him because that's what he wants to, to share with people so that they you know, um, do the same. And so that everybody in leadership is adding value and giving back more and using their profits from their organization to bless more people. So we kind of took on a tangent here, but this is fun because we have time today. We're, we, we have a lot more time than usual. I love, I love it. I love it because we get to chit chat more and have a, a good time just taking a tangent like we just did. But in the end, you got to watch yourself. Like after listening to us today, what level do you find yourself on and what's the one that's most consistent like you know that you find yourself on the most is it the undertaker is it the caretaker maybe you're a playmaker maybe you're just one tweak away from becoming that coveted game changer right so whatever level you're on you're we're starting the year we're, st we're still in january and we thought this podcast was uh, right on spot on for the beginning of the year to, uh, to have the right mindset and to also have the, uh, the right positioning in your mind saying, hey, I may be there, but I don't want to stay there. I want to go higher. I want to dig deeper to go higher. That's what we did today. We dug deeper. Hopefully, you're going to go higher. Absolutely. And if you didn't get our uh, last episode, episode 29, on uh, mindset versus kingdom mindset, you're going to want to listen to that. This is really going to help you work your mindset in a biblical way for you to really focus on having a kingdom mindset. And we, we explain the differences between both. And I think it's really going to bless you. So if you enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to share it with your other friends on Facebook, wherever you're listening in from. I know that they're, they're going to really enjoy it. And if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, you can go to thrivingonpurposepodcast.com and you can just sign up to our podcast so that you can get each episode when they come out every week. So we're also going to leave you a link to get Dave's uh, book called Unstoppable, Transforming Your Mindset to Create Change to Accelerate Results and Be the Best at What You Do. So we're going to leave you a link to get his book and uh, we hope that that's going to really uh, help you to live the game changer life. So be blessed and thrive on. Have a good week, guys. Thanks for listening to the Thriving on Purpose podcast. Be sure to visit thrivingonpurpose.com to access the show notes and to discover more fantastic content.
Until next time, be blessed and may you thrive on purpose.